Kira Knightley is is getting ready for um, you know, to go out for the night. So this handheld, we wanted to create a kind of an abrasive masculine aspect for Robbie's part. So to that end, we used two tracks off the same album by a guy called Mark Lanigan. And Robbie's section, it's, it's all post-dubbed afterwards, but it was a very hard, angular rock track. So it, it gave it a, a kind of testosteronic feel. And then for off, off the same album, there's a song called Come To Me, which led Kira and I with the handheld camera and the focus puller ebbing in and out of focus to give it a very languid, sexy, feminine uh, quality. So it's interesting when you cut that together how you can feel the, the timbre, the photographic timbre of, of each one. And the, the music really helped that. Other, other one thing to mention in this as well is that for the film, I used uh, stockings on the back of the lens. There were Christian Dior, Ken Denier, Nets. It's an old Hollywood technique that actresses love. Kira loves it because it makes her, you know, she's beautiful anyway, but it just gives a glow to the faces. And it's a sort of a, a an old technique in Hollywood, but um, it's one that I, I, I used in, in this film. So have a look at this, and then we can talk if any questions. It was, it was a stage or it was interior? No, it was, it was just a house, a little cottage. Yeah, it was, everything was real location. Location, yeah. So have you used light from outside? Um, here, I, it was available light, except for I used a little um, um, lamp that I flared the camera with. Mm -hmm. It was like literally just a, a torch, in fact. So, you know, I'd be moving around. I actually shot it with an easy rig, so an over, so I could handhold with one camera and flare the lens with the other hand. And why did you decide to flare the lens? Well, well, it was to create cutting points back and forward from the various scenes. So when you when you flare the lens, it creates a natural cutting point. It also I wanted to give a sense of the balmy heat of the summer, and also it, it's just it distorts the image in a in a in a great way. It gives it a kind of a, a dreamy uh, sort of almost uh, subconscious feel. And in the scene we're using very soft lighting. It was any ideas of the script which requires you to use like this particular kind of soft. Well, I wanted, Almost glamorous lighting. Yes, yeah. Well, for for her section here, you know, it, it was basically the ambient light bounced off the mirror. Really, it was it was pretty much available light. For Robbie's section here, I just had a single source, nothing else, just a little bit of bounce. Uh, but basically, it was an 18k through a window, and nothing else, just some. Reflector boards to push it back in. So in fact, it was kind of small set. It was as like it like normal independent film. Yeah, small set. It was a tiny little cottage that we basically uh, just about fitted the camera and me, <laughs> and the director in there. Um, Joe also likes the use of uh, extreme close-ups, so we used a lot of diopters, you know, uh, to to create extreme close-up. So I think that finishes that, that section. But this was all a real a real location. Um, given the film a really interesting look because there's a, a cont continuity of, of the, the light. But it really, I mean, for, well, for the six weeks we were filming, it poured rain for a lot of it. So it, our, the interiors that were 
felt sunny were lit sunny. You know, while it was pouring rain outside and then we, we shot from rain. And what was a low budget film, at one point in this film, that they put a lot of the money into one scene. And it kind of, I argued against this scene. I work a lot with Joe Wright, the director of this film. And we, we think very, very carefully, way in advance, about every single shot that we do and every single sequence. Do a lot of storyboarding, planning. Very, Joe's the most precise of any director I've worked with. And Joe had this idea, we found a location, there were, there were several little scenes that he wanted to make into one big scene on a beach. It's a sort of a, a steady cam shot, actually. I didn't operate it. It was a great operator, Pete Robertson, who's the, the genius behind this shot. But um, I argued stridently against it, this shot. I mean, in the end, it got me an Oscar nomination. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very happy about that now. But at the time, I thought it was really over the top. I thought it, it was drawing attention to itself. It was a, a show-off moment when the script, I felt, didn't need it or warrant it. But it's uh, 11 by the sea. I think that's, uh, that's where it is. But Joe argued very carefully and, and properly that it was a, a necessary way of showing Robbie this character's uh, it's almost hallucinogenic. He's dying at this point. He, he wanted to play with notions of the camera as both a subjective and an objective device within the same shot. So he wanted to play with shifting the audience's perspective to one of interiority of the character's dilemma, you know, a, a kind of a carousel interior moment to then being more objective and witnessing the scene as, as a dispassionate eye. So it's interesting that this shot plays with those two uh, ways of, of photographing within the same shot. So maybe we can just uh, show a little piece of it and I can talk through aspects of it. There's no CG in, in this film can afford it. Um, it's, uh, it's all in camera. So um, th that was another thing that y you basically have to, uh, you, know, you have to plan it very much in advance. And we, we uh, had a maquette of the, uh, of the, uh, the set that we used a little uh, camera and a mirror to, to show the trajectory of the camera so that and we had to plan it very carefully in advance because the tide was only out for a couple of hours in the day and it, when the light was good, it was going to be the afternoon, we knew that we only had a window of, uh, you know, two hours to shoot the film. So we managed to get three takes of this and, and the, the take that you see is is the last take when the light was good um, <coughs> and uh, it, but on the, the, we attempted to do a fourth take because the video assist broke down on the third take so the director wasn't able to, s to see what we had and I had to assure him that we, it, we had it in the can but it was a very nervous night until I, I got the dailies report the next day and, and, and it worked. These are all extras, all thousand extras. So this is the start of the shot. is on a, it's a steady cam on a little milk float that was being driven alongside them. Uh, you can see the, the tracks of the milk float there. And it's amazing, this many extras, all people who've never been on a film set before, there's not a single person who looks at the camera or does anything, so it was a very nerve-wracking time. We were just very lucky with the light on this day, with the smoke and everything. And at this
this point, the cameraman is stepping off the milk float and is now walking freely with the steady cam. Coordinated and bringing these, you know, to lead the camera up. You know, there were visual effects and special effects at work to to lead the, the eye upwards. Just to give you context, this is about uh, one of the most dramatic episodes of World War II when the British Army was encircled in Dunkirk and about to take over by uh, Germans and by many circumstances it's not happened, but it was one of the most uh, dramatic episodes in the world. So that Ferris wheel, is, people have said, that's amazing, the, the CGI Ferris wheel with the people hanging off it. That was, that was all real. <laughs> <laughs> Exposure changes as well here, so I'm having to ride the exposure as we go into the bandstand. I have to open up to you know 2.8, whereas the rest of it is, is at T8. Um, and they're also we shot with a lightweight zoom, so there are, I was uh, remotely zooming as well as stop pulling, and then we had an additional focus pull as well. So. Is it, is it, I forgot, is considered one of the longest shot in history or Rosevsky's longest? Oh, between you and Rosevsky, who right? <laughs> is the longest shot? I think, I think uh, Soy Cuba had a longer shot. Uh -huh. but, um, <laughs> if anybody knows film, I'm, I'm, I'm Cuba. Yeah. Soy Cuba, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, it was a big article about uh, Seamus in the Los Angeles Times, I remember, like, uh, about like one of the longest shots, so people know sure who is long, who, who is longest, who, who has the longest shot. <laughs> what about Russian arc? <laughs> Russian arc, actually, that. That's a but yeah. Russian arc is quite different. Russian yeah. arc is basically based as a concept as same as a Hitchcock. Right. Film is one shot, right. so it's slightly different, yeah. and different technology. But recently, we can argue that it's probably the longest shot. But they did stops. They move in the wall, go again. Same as a Hitchcock. Here is a receiver. And the Rusevsky is the same shot. Yeah. Yeah, Rusevsky, that cinematographer Yuri is describing, he's my favorite cinematographer of all time. His work, I Am Cuba, and the cranes are flying. Um, really, if you get a chance to see them. So by this stage, you know, the poor Steadicam operator has like, got jelly legs and it's, <laughs> it's quite a feat. But we were all on tenter hooks here because it could, it could easily have gone belly up at this point. But it was, it was lovely. I mean, I get nervous watching this shot because of the, you know, the sh the, we tried to set up another shot after this, but the light was just exquisite, I think. This one, we were just very lucky. Well, we, as I say, we had a little model, scale model of the beach, uh, and we sat down with a little, um, it was almost like a, a lipstick camera on a stick. So we, we could look at the perspective, the best angles where we would see the, I knew where the light was going to be, so we would actually put a little, tor like a, a torch, knowing that at 6 30 the sun was going to be there, how the light would fall. And actually, the two previous takes to this were done in full sunlight. And there was a lot of lens flare. It was a lot of more silhouette -y. And I was disappointed, you know, because it just didn't look as good. So then finally, when with all the diffusion in the atmosphere and the cloud came in, suddenly there was this wonderful ambience that you could look in, in all directions. And, you know, the, the stop pulls weren't so extreme. It just fa fitted the, the more languorous mood mm. of the shot in more subdued light. But we actually planned the shot maybe three months in advance. Mm. Um, we 
thought very carefully about the trajectory of the of the camera, so that the assistant directors could maximise the extras. I mean, it was sort of funny, you know, when the first we, we come up and we're in profile, all the extras are crowded into one area, and then when we get into close up and Robbie, all the extras are hurtling around to 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 build up the just to maximise the the amount of extras we had. Um, and I mean. As I said, I was really unsure about about the shot. I just thought it was, and it was actually a little bit more elaborate in the, in the first planning of it. There was at one point, uh, Joe wanted the operator to get on a crane and and be lifted up, and then there was, yeah, and then there was he had this notion that he could kind of abseil off the crane. <laughs> you know, it was it was a bit more elaborate. We at one point we were up closer to the. Ferris wheel, but in the end, it was just too histrionic. I th I thought it was a little bit too hysterical, and we knew that we we wanted to at least have three attempts at the shot before the tide came in again. So to we knew we had to simplify it a little bit more. Uh, in the end, you know, as I said, we attempted a fourth uh, shot, but. It, the, the light was really not good, the light was going, and actually the operator, Pete Robb, halfway through, kind of had a little bit of a tumble, and that was that was it, we abandoned the shot, but we didn't know we had it in the can. And I remember taking the magazine and saying to the loader, you know, this 500 foot magazine is the most important, like, one you'll ever download. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> Don't fog it, please. And uh, you know, so that that was fun actually. When you when you know how precious that bit of celluloid is, but the next day we we had a lovely system of of watching our dailies. This was shot on film. If anyone remembers what that was, <laughs> but uh, we shot it on Kodak film. And every day we would have a little tent where we would project our dailies, and uh, it it was great. The excitement of loading the actual print onto a projector and showing it was just and we sat down hoping it was going to be there and the, I never forget the goose pimples that we had all felt while we watched it because it, it was like a, a kind of a performance art in some way that was captured you know and it was it was unique to to that moment and, you know it's just one of those magical things the alchemy of cinema is, is kind of interesting sometimes when you get results like that the, a lovely happy coincidence of, of light, of extras, of performance. You know, I know it, it, it happens sometimes, but I really believe in it. There's, um, what's the Tarkovsky film, Yuri, it's where true. I think it might be either Mirror, where the couple are sitting on a, on a, on a fence. And, mirror. And the mirror, and then the, the man walks out into the field and Tarkovsky said, you know, it just happened to be that as he walked out, a wind suddenly appeared and all the corn was swirling, swirling. I mean, it was emotional magic. Yeah, they, 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 they sent the helicopter. Did they really? Yeah, yeah. There was. Uh, okay, okay. okay. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it's a very important part. Okay, first of all, hopefully everybody knows the uh, Tarkovsky name, right? His was cinematographer in this case was Rehberg, one of the best cinematographers of them. And, he, and they, they, is, it, they sh okay, bottom line is it was Tarkovsky uh, idea to have this. Obviously, it was low budget film compared to everything else, so, but the important part is, is they sent a helicopter to create these things because a military ha ha helicopter and they instruct him how to do it. And they, <laughs> They rehearsed, but the important part is, I hope you all pay attention to what she was saying. In low budget film, or independent film, whatever you like to call it, okay, you cannot have both, and money and time. It doesn't happen this way in this world. You have to have time for planning, because you cannot make a mistake. You have no margin, or you're doing only once, or two takes, because it's low budget. So in this case, preparation, to the everything, rehearsal, as you must say. It's the most important film. And big budget, you can screw up whatever you want. They have mine. They say, okay, let's do it again. And sometimes people doing, it does make, it, make, it does make 
very good films or good imagery, but it's what it is. And low budget, you have to have be totally prepared because you have a limited amount of the time for shooting. But you have to have a lot of time for prep. When you, go, when you go do your first or second or next low budget film, always keep in mind to have enough time to prep because you have no, no margin. You have no margin, absolutely. When I did my first independent film in New York in the sky, I have 40 days of shooting with all special effects. But I request three months of the prep, period. It was unheard of for independence of that. I'm supposed to do all special effects. I have to do everything myself with my team. So I have to prepare. We, we can say, well, let's do it next day. It will be no next day. I just have to go on schedule. All right. So very important lesson, which you hope you get from mm, Preparation is most important. But before preparation goes, one more thing, thinking of what you're doing. Because you cannot prepare what you don't know about. You have to know what you're preparing. So you have to have idea first, what you're going to teach you. Idea first. Now, now with you know what idea is, you're preparing because you know how much time it will take to prepare your idea, maybe in, in distilled way or like in different way, but your idea, how to make your idea working. And then, very simple, you, ha you have to do it. It's true, actually, there is a, a, a real democracy of ideas with working with Joe Wright, for instance. And it, it's not just, the cinematography is born out of, of communication and talking, but it's also <coughs> not specifically about photography. You know, the design is a critical aspect of it for me. So I work very closely with the production designer in advance, talking about color, about textures, about about the way, the design of the sets even, to allow me to shoot in a particular way. And that was very true of, of Anna Karenina, which, you know, we prepped long period in advance to, to work out transitions between scenes. There was very much a collaboration between design and cinematography in this film. And, uh, you know, when I was lucky enough to get an Oscar nomination for this one, but uh, it, it, there was a point where the photography and the design really overlapped. <coughs> you know, had I won, <laughs> I would have credited the designer, you know, because it, it really was a, a, a democratic collaboration between costume, design, direction, and cinematography. And when everyone's on the same path, in tune with the script and in tune with with all the other departments if you're traveling in parallel lines it'll make for a, an impactful cinematographic experience um just about that that one shot i just had a, a couple questions um did you use anything other than just like ambient light diffused by clouds or was that that's, that's pretty it. much that's all it was yeah it was all i mean <coughs> Because of the, the trajectory of the camera, the, you couldn't get any lights in there. Yeah. It was over such a big area. It would have been, and we were in narrow areas, even a little bounce board would have been impossible to to um, work with. I mean, I must say that I was helped greatly. Although I was riding the stop and going from like T8 to maybe T2.8 under the bandstand, and there were a couple of zooms that are disguised in there, going from very wide to close-up moments, just so we had a little lightweight zoom. Um, but I was helped greatly in the DI. This was my first digital intermediate. Mm -hmm. um, previously, I was doing purely photochemical <coughs> grading at the laboratory. Uh, and th there were times when I was really helped with uh, little vignettes, you know, because the discrepancy and the brightness between the bright sky and then Robbie's face and camera moving up and down like this, it was, I was able to do a lot that way. Uh, and, you know, I, I haven't looked back. I haven't done a photochemical grade since Atonement. So the DI is, is somewhere where you can really be helped in, in, in the look. Yeah. And then also, other than just practice how do you how do you get the uh the the aperture or those like changes in stops yeah. to look so fluid without even like realizing that the exposure is changing yeah i suppose you just do it very gradually yeah and you, you have to feel where that exposure takes place and bury it 
in a camera move. It's the same as true of zooms. I mean, if, if you've got a static shot and you suddenly zoom in, you're going to see it. But if it's on a move, you know, as the camera's going around, you can really hide that that movement. So I suppose subtlety and, and a gentle touch means that you can disguise those things. But I, I do, I mean, a lot of people won't write exposure, but, you know, having come from a, and trained in a cinema tradition, in a film tradition with film, I'm very precise with exposure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I do love, even in interiors, uh, riding the exposure, because you can really create a particular look. You can, you can also uh, direct an audience's attention by, by going wide open and having less depth of field. At, at a particular point, and that can be done sometimes in combination with the shutter angle change. If you want to to open up, I've done that before, where you incrementally narrow the shutter angle and then open up the aperture in shot to to create uh, shallower depth of field. Mm -hmm. That can work. It, it works really well. It was. It was a terrible crappy little video lens for, for this shot because we, d we, kn we knew it had to be a lightweight device. I think it was a, a, a 17 to 34 mil. It's called a video zoom. <laughs> and you know, it, okay, it's not optically as good as the primos that we shot the rest of the film on, but we needed, we knew we needed a zoom and it had to be lightweight. So you kind of forsake that, you know. A, a lot of people are very uh, picky about the glass that they put in front of the camera, and it does have a, a bearing. You know, glass lenses have very peculiar personalities. They're like little children, you know. <laughs> I, I see them as, you know, I, for instance, uh, on Anna Karenina, we shot, it was an anamorphic production, and we shot with C series anamorphic lenses as well as G's, and the, you really see the, di the difference in them. They're, um, the, the G's are sharp and contrasty, uh, and the C's have got a, a flaring characteristics. So they're, they're very, very different uh, lenses. Godzilla I just shot with um, the C's because we wanted a particular flare, and we used lens flare a lot as an emotional device, you know, by having points of light in in camera creating distortions and the director really wanted to, to play with that as an emotional effect. Um, the primos that we shot uh, atonement on are very crisp, sharp, contrasty lenses that hold the flare and I wanted that because um, I was diffusing it on the back of the lens and I knew that you know, looking at bright windows, I, I needed to have something that would bite, hold the, the contrast and not be completely muddy and milky. So I needed to start with the sharpest lens possible and then I, I sort of stretched stockings on the back of the, on the, back of the, the lens. And it's a, it's a nice effect. So that's what you mother saw. You said you were originally arguing against it. What were you arguing for at that time? Well, at the point it was written, the script was actually four separate scenes. So all it, on the beach. Yeah, all on the beach. And when we found the location and we knew where the, the fall of the light and what direction we were gonna be, we realized that in a day's shooting we, we simply didn't have enough time to to shoot all four scenes. So it kinda came out of expediency initially. Oh. The idea was Joe said, Well we'll just do it in one shot then. <laughs> And because uh, we've only got a two hour window and we'll, we'll make it work. So it's a conflation of four scenes into one. Uh, so it, it really came out of knowing that the tide was out for two hours. That's, that's, but you know, having said that, Joe loves these one shot deals and we've done it in a few movies and usually they end up on the cutting room floor. On The Soloist, for instance, there was a, a very long shot. Again, it was five and a half minutes that involved a tracking vehicle with a crane on it, uh, a, 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 you know, a techno crane on a Titan moving arm, you know, but so elaborate, all shot in downtown LA. And it was, it was a beautiful experience shooting it. We did it to some music again, and it was, 
it was a kind of symphonic ode to the homeless people in, in downtown LA. I mean, I think it's, it's probably there in the DVD extra somewhere, but it's certainly not in the movie, because it was, it ended up being a little bit of a self-important, you know, you know, shot, I think. So, and, you know, in, in here, in Anna Karenina, we, we did one, which I'd like to, to show you, actually. It's, yeah, it's basically, this something I tried, it, it's, it's when Vronsky, uh, it's a bit further down, Vronsky drags uh, Anna Karenina, this, this, this one five, 